Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. My name is Ben Follett. I am the U.S. Product and Marketing Manager for SIA. Um, joining me today will be my colleague uh, Garrett Peters, who is a structural engineer that works for us here in the United States. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about different types of advanced analysis in SIA Engineer. And so before we jump into the main meat of our presentation, um, I'd like to talk a little bit just about Nemencheck as a company. Many of you may not be familiar with Nemencheck, the Nemencheck group, but you may be familiar with some of our, our brands. And so you can see some of those brands on the screen here. Um, brands that you're familiar with in the United States, maybe Graphisoft, which makes Archicad, Bluebeam, uh, SDS2, Design Data, Vectorworks, um, Celebri, and obviously SIA is the software that we're here to talk to you about today. And so C Engineer is really part of a new breed of integrated 3D structural design programs. Simply put, we're a little bit different um, than other companies in the sense that we're really focused on um, being a, a full solution for um, design, analysis, modeling, documentation, um, reporting um, in a f functional 3D environment. And so actually engineering.com uh, in a product review said C Engineer is one of the most capable structural engineering softwares that you've never heard of. And so we're really working in the United States to change that. And so one of the ways that we're changing that is, is through our customers obviously. And so these are all companies that use C Engineer. Um, some in the United States um, being some of the larger just kind of consulting engineering companies like Walter P. Moore, Thornton Tomasetti, or SOM. Um, some of the just larger industrial companies like Floor, Mammut, um, URS, AECOM. You know, so we really have a wide range of different types of customers that use and utilize the software. Now, most people use different software for different applications. And one of the things that we like to say about C Engineer is that no matter what type of project you work on, no matter where you're looking to start or finish, you can use C Engineer. And so we find people using SIA for any, any different type of project. So from office and residential complexes, um, industrial buildings, more EPC related structures, so towers, mass, power plants, even infrastructure projects, bridges and tunnels. We have a lot of people, uh, especially in the states, doing a lot of um, what I would call kind of environmental structures or buried tank structures, pools, um, you know, agriculture storage sheds and, and, and structures. And then obviously there's specialty structures. And that's really another one of the nice benefits to see is that we're not really we're not really telling you that you have to be stuck in this box of saying you have to do this very rectilinear building structure with composite floors. If you need to do something that's a little bit more advanced, that's a little bit more um, ornamental or, or um, out there as far as geometry is concerned, and you need the analysis to back it up, you can do that in C Engineer. And so really just a, a brief overview um, for analysis. We're going to touch on a few different types of analysis today um, specifically, but this is just kind of a general overview of the different types of analysis that's available in SIA. And so we have different nonlinear types of analysis, um, just your basic P-delta effects or initial imperfections, the direct analysis method, um, other advanced nonlinear cases with nonlinear springs and friction supports. Obviously, a, long, a, a large range of dynamic things, uh, free vibration, time history, seismic, the equivalent lateral force procedure, pushover analysis, some time-dependent stuff, whether it's construction staging or pre-stressing and absence design, uh, stability analysis, soil structure interaction, and then sequential analysis. So all of these different things are available um, within C Engineer, and C Engineer is the one program in which these are all available in. Now, certainly, you don't have to buy functionality, all the functionality. Um, you can only buy part of it, and so it, it's really up to you. Um, and so with that, we're going to jump into kind of our agenda for today, which is to look more specifically at four different types of advanced analysis. And now before we look at the agenda, I wanted to make a comment that um, in your GoToWebinar uh, panel, there is the questions tab. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please place them in that questions tab. Um, we'll look at them throughout the presentation. And then uh, for the, with the time that we have left over, about 10 to 15 minutes, we'll go ahead and answer some of those questions um, at the end of the presentation. And so just a, a brief agenda today, uh, we're going to go ahead and look at uh, nonlinear analysis with cables. Uh, we're going to look at soil interaction. And so really the idea of, of you know, con these contact stresses and, and other things, um, stability analysis, and then material-based plasticity. 
and so that's kind of the focus of, of what we're going to look at um, in, in this webinar today. And so if we go ahead and jump into our, our first uh, thing here, we're going to go ahead and look right in C Engineer for about nonlinear analysis and cables. And so I'm going to go ahead and jump into the model. And I, to do this, we're going to look at this guide mast, right? And so I just have um, right now just modeled in a structure um, with some, you know, some, some cable supports. Now, I haven't defined them yet as cables, and we'll go ahead and do that. And so the first thing I'm going to do, let's just see the loads that are applied to this particular structure. So if I select loads here, we can go ahead and see the different types of loads that we have applied. So I've got some, some temperature loads. We've got some wind loading. Uh, we've got some just general live loading uh, as point loads on the structure. Um, and then, like I said, we have some positive and negative temp temperature loading on, on, the, on the cables themselves. And so in order to utilize the cable functionality, since it is a type of nonlinear functionality, we need to go ahead into the project settings, and we need to enable what we want to use. And so one of the nice things about C is that you can enable different functionality at any time throughout the project. And so you don't have to have all the different types of nonlinear or, or different types of advanced analysis on. If you need to do it for that particular type, type, type of project or at that particular time, you can go ahead and enable them. So in this case, we have enabled nonlinear, and we also have enabled uh, our cable functionality, and we also have enabled our beam local nonlinearity. This allows us the opportunity to actually select a particular 1D member, a beam, and apply a certain nonlinear uh, parameter to it. And so for next, I'm going to go ahead and we need to define that these particular members are cables. And so in the structure service, I'm going to expand the model data and navigate here to beam nonlinearity. And so when beam nonlinearity opens up, we see the different types of nonlinearity that we have options for, pressure only, tension only, limit force, gaps, initial stress. So we really have two types of cables, if you will. First is just a simple initial stress where we can just apply an initial stress. Second, though, and the, what we're going to talk about today is, is a more advanced cable type. And so we have two options as far as way, the way we can use the cable, whether it's going to be a straight cable, so no initial slack, or it's going to be a calculated cable, which is a slack cable that has its slack, its initial deformation before the load is applied, that initial stress is applied, applied, that's calculated in some way. In this case, we can calculate it based on the self-weight of that cable, or we can calculate it based on... Uh, our own load that we have applied. So it's really up to you at that case. In this case, we're going to use that self-weight, and I'm going to apply a normal force of 1,500 pounds on each of the cables. And so once I go ahead and select OK, I can go ahead and just select the cables to apply those nonlinear types to. And so you can see here by this little graphic that we've assigned those nonlinear types to them. Now, before we go ahead and run the analysis, we need to see... Uh, we need to have nonlinear combinations. And so I've created some just linear combinations. These are just linear combinations that are either, either created by, from scratch or they're created um, by using uh, the automatic generators. We can actually use those linear combinations to create nonlinear combinations. And so in this case, what I've done here is I've selected new from linear, and then we've just selected those linear combinations that we wanted to match in nonlinear combinations as well. So we've got our four nonlinear combinations set. The last thing that we have to do is make sure that the solver settings are set appropriately. And so within the solver settings, we have now the nonlinear solver set up. And we're going to choose a geometric nonlinearity for third order analysis, so a, for, for large deformations. So this is an iterative solution that's suitable for most models that utilize membranes or, or cables in this case, really suitable where you tend to have larger deflections. And in that, we're going to go ahead and use this newton raphson method. And so we have other methods that are available, um, but the newton raphson method is kind of the most widely accepted and the most stable as far as uh, a typical model like this is concerned. With all that information defined now, we can go ahead and run the analysis. Now I'm going to run the linear and nonlinear analysis as batch. We're going to run them together. And so if I click OK, our solver will start here, and we'll very quickly run through the linear analysis, and then we'll jump into our nonlinear analysis, and we'll see the nonlinear curves start to generate for those four different uh, load combinations. And so as they generate, we'll see the little graph here that'll show us um, the nonlinear combinations with the rotation and deflection. And so there's nonlinear combination one. And so when the analysis is complete, we can go ahead and look at our results. And so in this particular setup, we have now, again, our results available to us. And so we can see our results. So I'll click on results here. 
and we can go ahead and look at different types of results. So maybe the initial result that we want to look at is uh, the internal forces on our beams, and, or on our beams, and these maybe are the axial forces that are being generated in our cable elements. And so if we wanted to actually just select our cable elements so that we only see those elements, we can go ahead and look at the axial force. So here's just different various axial forces. This is based on the den load. Let's go look at one based on maybe the wind, the dead, and the live load. So we can see the axial force in these particular cases. Right? And this is obviously tension. This is non-compression forces, right? So these are all tension forces in these members. Now, just with anything that we can go ahead and look at these values in a table, so we can just see these values in the table for whatever the cross-section is and whatever the case that we're using. We could also go ahead and look at some other results. Let's look at maybe deformations on the beam. So we can go ahead and choose a nonlinear combination. In this case, we'll choose a serviceability combination. Again, we'll select that we only want to see things on, in this particular case, just for our, our, uh, our output, just want to see things on the, the cables. And we can go ahead and look at our initial deformation first. So here's our initial deformation, right? So this is the initial deformation based on the initial characteristics of the self-weight, right? It's a slack cable, so the self-weight applied to uh, the members. And then we can also change this from an initial to our global deformation. Right? So now we have deformation based on the fact that we had a deformed shape of the cable, and then in addition to the deformed shape of the cable, which we saw in that initial state, we have all of the load then applied to that cable, and we have our new deflections. And this is why we're getting really that's that we're getting that that sag or that real that real noticeable drape in our in our particular cables. Now, finally, we can go ahead and look at uh, our deformed structure. And so again, we can choose one of our serviceability combinations and see then how the structure is deflecting based on you know, the deformation that's, that's occurring in the structure. So maybe we'll go ahead and look at one of the wind cases so we can see some lateral deflection. So here we have some lateral deflection of the frame in addition to the deflection that's happening um, in the cables. And so we can see this deformation, and if we really want to, we can choose the animation window to actually see the movement of this structure. So to really try to understand exactly what's going on um, in the deformation of this particular um, in this particular structure. Now all the results are available in the engineering report. Um, we can look at other results as well. Obviously we can look at our support reactions. Uh, we can look at different internal forces or different stresses in the members, um, different displacements of nodes. But really the idea here is the cables um, can have a slack. You can calculate them uh, with an initial stress. Obviously there are elements that have no compression in them and so you can do a true a really a true cable analysis without having to do any of the workarounds that you may find in some of the other softwares where maybe you have to apply a, a temperature or you have to um, do a few different other things to really arrive at that true cable analysis. So if you have more questions about cable analysis we'll, we'll revisit that at the end but now we're going to go ahead and switch back to um, our presentation and look at our next um, kind of advanced analysis uh, topic, which is this idea of soil interaction. So being able to really look at maybe a mat slab or, or create and have different soil interaction characteristics um, throughout a model. And so if I go switch back to SIA, I'm going to again pick a different model here. So I'll switch back to this kind of mat foundation. And so in this mat foundation, if we turn on the thickness in the rendering, we can see a few different things. The first is um, I've got some uh, no, I've got some nodes which signify maybe columns, and so I've added some point loads to those. And so we can look at the loads here. We've got different point loads, so different uh, dead loading, right? So we've just got some dead loading in, uh, in point load fashion at these low column locations, if you will. We also have this loading, uh, just kind of a uniform load across the whole structure. We can look at the live loading. So we've got two different live loads here. Again, we have the live loading at the columns, if you will. And then we have two different surface loads, one on this section over here in green and one on this section over here in orange. And then finally, we have the wind loading. And so in this case, we're saying, well, maybe there's going to be some uplift or, or something on this partic these particular set of columns over here. And so we've, we've, we've signified that with those upward forces. Additionally, you can see we've got an opening in the slab. And then we also have what we call a subregion. A subregion is just a thickened or thin portion of the slab, and so we actually have the ability to, within the same two-dimensional element, so if I select this one element, we can see here that it's all one 2D element, but we can thicken out a portion so that we get different stresses, different deflections, um, different concrete design, whatever we need in that particular case, but we get those differences in this particular model. 
And so the one thing that we don't yet have here is we don't yet have our support condition. And so if I, if I change out of the loads portion and go to the structure service and modeling and draw, excuse me, model data, we have our option to use surface supports. And so these surface supports are just enabled in the functionality tab, the same way that we enabled the cable information. It's just enabled with a subsoil. There's just a checkbox for subsoil. And so if we click on surface elastic foundation, we can create a subsoil. And so in many cases, really what we're creating is this, or really what we want to add is this spring constant for the C1, Z factor. It's this one kind of highlighted in green here. Now we can set, uh, in this case, it has to be flexible. If we had other things enabled nonlinear, it could be a nonlinear spring. It could be uh, a friction spring. There's some different things that we could do here. In this case, though, it's just a, a flexible spring that we can define in units of pound per cubic inch. Now, this is really your subgrade modulus, right, your case of S. And so this is what's going to be used to calculate that bearing pressure. And so this can come from a variety of sources, whether it's coming from your geotechnical engineer, whether it's going to come from, uh, I know I, I use a, a graph that I, that I have in a foundations book that has a case of, case of S uh, on one uh, axis and uh, bearing capacity on another axis, and there's a curve, and you can kind of figure out what your... Um, what your case of S factor is based on what your uh, known bearing capacity is or your bearing limit is. And so there's different ways to, can, to determine that case of S factor. You can create mul as many subsoils as you want. So you can see here we can create a whole list of subsoils. And so you could do different things, apply them in different locations, create them um, in different uh, on different slabs, or use them to determine you know, what the, how the building is going to react in different conditions. And so if we select this particular subsoil, I can go ahead then and apply it to uh, this slab. And so it's applied to the entirety of the slab. It just shows on the edge because that's how the render it is. But it is applied to the entirety of the slab. Now if we go ahead and run the analysis here, I'm going to go ahead and run uh, the linear analysis. So we'll just click to go and we'll run the linear analysis. It should take no more than a second here. And we'll generate ourselves results. Now obviously all these results are based on a finite element mesh that's generated in this model. In this case, we had a, a local mesh size. I also did some mesh refinement. That's not necessarily the, the point of this webinar. We actually did a webinar all about meshing, and if you're interested in that, um, we can talk a little bit more about that at the end, or I can send you the link to view that webinar on the Civil Structural Engineer website. Um, but in this case now, if we go ahead and look at our results, and let's go ahead and on, we'll turn our, our mesh off. We can go ahead and look at different displacements, or mainly here, the real result from that elastic foundation support is this idea of contact stresses. And so if we choose to look at our contact stresses for the combination uh, dead plus live, you know, we get our contact stresses for, for dead plus live here. Um, we can also see, we can see the deflected shape, so we can see how this is, is going here. We can see this given to us in, in pounds per square foot, right? Now, this is dead plus live, but remember, we had some uplift um, on the system over on this side. So if I switch this to dead plus wind, we can see, obviously, a much different, um, much different case. And so uh, while we have some downward force and some downward um, contact stresses at these columns over here, where we had that uplift due to wind, you can see that we have some negative pressure. Now, obviously, that negative pressure, it's, it's not allowed. You can't have subsoil that's in tension, right? And so the question then is, well, this is a linear analysis. What do we do What do we do about the subsoil that's in tension? And so the way to solve this is to actually run a nonlinear analysis. And so if I go into the project settings and into the functionality, we can go ahead and click on nonlinear and we can enable this support nonlinearity soil spring. And so doing that now, obviously our nonlinear combinations are available again. We can create, we have two nonlinear combinations, right? So nonlinear combination for dead plus live and a nonlinear combination for dead plus wind. We can look at our nonlinear setup. In this particular case, there's not really anything to change. We're going to stick with the method that we're using. Um, but we can go ahead now and run a nonlinear combination. And so I'm going to go ahead and run the linear analysis and the nonlinear analysis. So we'll run both of those together. Now the linear analysis was already run, so this sh should take no time at all. And so we'll have results for both linear and nonlinear analysis. So again, if we go into our results, and again to our contact stresses, if we first look as just kind of as a reminder of our contact stresses for a linear load case, we see that we have that negative subsoil pressure. 
Now, if we go ahead and switch our type of load to nonlinear, and we choose that NC2, which is our dead plus wind condition, we'll see that we have this kind of zeroing out of pressure. So right around the place where we actually have the uplift, we're getting this zero pressure, zero contact, stre contact stresses. And so really we're getting this kind of redistribution based on, you know, based on doing a nonlinear analysis, redistribution of our pressures over the, over the slab. And so we can see here now that we've got a much different distribution because of the zeroing out of the pressure over top of the slab. Now for any of these pressures, we can always look at different uh, information. You know, one of the nice things I like to look at is being able to look at information along the edges. So people are always concerned with, you know, what do the what what results do we get along the edges of slabs? And so we can see different results in PSF along the edges of slabs. And so in that case, we have a bunch of different results that we can look at um, for uh, these particular contact stresses. Finally, in addition to to anything else, we can go ahead and look at our three-dimensional deflection. And so here we can see how the entirety of the structure, even based on the thickness of the structure here, based on the fact that we have, um, you know, based on the fact that we have our, our thickened portion of the slab here, I think we have 16 inches and the 24 inches on this side, we can see that deflected shape. And so we can see even how the deflection of the top part of the slab is different than the deflection at the bottom part of the slab. So it really is a true three-dimensional deflection. And obviously we can see all this um, graphically or we can see this in a result. So if I expand this a little bit, right, we see actually, hey, we're using dead plus live, and here are the results for on 2D members, right? So we can see the total deflection is, you know, a little, little less, you know, 0.04 inches, right? So not a lot of load, not a lot of deflection based on the thickness of this particular slab. Okay, um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to uh, my colleague Garrett, who's going to uh, continue on with the presentation. Um, and talk about stability analysis and uh, material-based nonlinear analysis or material-based plasticity. So, Garrett? Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you can see my screen. Um, as Ben said, my name is Garrett Peters, and today uh, yeah, I'll be talking about the stability analysis and material plasticity features in SIA Engineer. So we'll go ahead and get started looking at stability analysis. So I've just prepared a relatively simple um, 1D element here. We have a column that's 40 feet. Um, on this column, we have a axial load of 100 kips, and the column is fixed at the base, and it's free at the top. It also has a um, support at the mid-span, so it's supported about its weak axis. And as, we, as we've seen with the other features, um, in order to enable stability, we first, first have to go into the project data, and then under the functionality tab, just make sure that stability is enabled as it is here. And so I've already run this um, project. I've run the calculation to do the, the linear stability analysis, so um, I'm not going to do that at this time. But before we really get into looking at some of the stability results, um, I first just want to look at the results due to the standard analysis. So if we come in here to the steel result service, um, we can go to ULS checks and then check LRFD. And if we hit refresh, we'll see that we get a unity check of 1.69. So that means that this column would fail. So um, we can then go into the report preview and look at the detailed output and kind of see why that fails. And as you might expect um, with this column, um, it fails due to buckling. So I can come into my buckling check. I see that out of the 1.69, the majority of that is due to this buckling check. I get a 1.67 um, for buckling alone. And if I scroll up a little bit, I can see with my um, buckling parameters, I have buckling factors of 2.0 and 0 0.53 for the strong and the weak axis. And those um, effective length factors are just taken as the idealized um, factors for this column. So because it's fixed at the bottom and free at the top, um, that gives me my two for the strong axis. And then for the weak axis, it's looking um, you know, it, it considers it fixed, fixed, at least for the bottom section, so we get our 0.53. So those are the, um, just kind of the idealized, you know, textbook um, effective length factors that we get with our standard analysis. So um, in order to take, take advantage of our stability analysis, we can then get out of the result service. So if we close out of the steel, we can then go into our results and to um, the deformed structure. 
So now we have the option here where we can we can say which stability combination we want to look at. So these are essentially uh, critical load coefficients that um, correspond to different buckling modes. So we can see um, if we if we set the stability combination to the first critical load combination, um, which is 2.5 times the applied load, we can see the buckling mode for that for that um, critical load coefficient. And if I turn on the uh, ge geometry of the of the column here. Um, I can see that this buckling is about the weak axis. So I can go down, look through the stability combinations, and I can see you know the second the second combination also about the weak axis. Um, and the third combination, finally we have a we have a buckling mode about the strong axis here. So I can take that stability, I can take that information from the stability analysis now and go back into the steel check. Um, and I can apply buckling data to the column. So we've actually already applied some buckling data, and by default, that buckling data just uses uses the coefficients from the standard analysis. So I can come in here now and change that to from the stability analysis. And what that allows us to do now is for the strong and the weak axis to to bring in those stability combinations. Um, so I know for the strong axis it was mode three, and for the weak axis it was mode one. And without having to rerun the analysis or anything, I can now go back to the to the LRFD check. Um, go back into the LRFD check, and I can refresh, and I can get I can get my result using those updated um, K factors from the stability analysis. So now you can see it's much better. It was 1.69 before, and now we have a unity check of 0.52, so much better than before. And not only is it much better, but it's actually more realistic. So we can come come in now and look at the Look at the report preview and see the detailed output. And now in this case, we have, as a, as a result of the changes we made, the buckling check has a unity value of 0.51, so much better than it was before. And now we have our more realistic buckling factors or effective length factors of 0.56 in the strong axis and 1.03 in the weak axis. So this was a 1D model, um, relatively straightforward. I'd like to show that we could also do um, something similar for a 2D model. So here we just have a tank. Um, I've, I've used, I've modeled um, the walls and the top of the tank using 2D members, and we have a uniform, a uniformly applied surface load to you know both the top and the walls. And just as we did with you know the other project, we have to make sure the stability functionality is enabled, which it is here. Um, so then I can go into the results. And just as I did before, look at the 3D displacements, and we can look at the different buckling modes using the different combinations. So here we have combination one, um, the first buckling mode, and we can define the number that we want to see here. Here we have you know up to eight, but we can you know look at the different different ways in which these plates will buckle. And this is especially useful because now we can determine where it buckles and where we might need stiffeners, um, might need to add stiffeners to prevent that buckling. And finally, just as um, Ben had showed with one of the other models, we can look at the 3D animation and, and show how, how the buckling occurs um, with an animated view here. So we can slow it down a little bit and set it to seven seconds. We can see now you know, how that buckling would occur in those plates. And so that concludes the stability analysis part. Um, so next we will look at material plasticity. And so for this model, um, again, I've, I've created a project using 2D members or 2D elements. And here we just have um, a column, a base of a column with the base plate and some stiffeners. And so again, just with as we've done with stability, now we're looking at nonlinearity. So in the functionality tab, let's, we have to make sure nonlinearity is enabled. And then since we're looking at material plasticity, um, we make sure that general plasticity is enabled here. So set that in the project. And then we can go into the material definition. So this, for this particular model, we're using an A36 steel for every element. So we can look at the material, um, which I've called A36 plastic. And since we have enabled nonlinearity in the model, we can come in here into the material behavior now. And we still have the option to make the material elastic if we'd like, but now we also have the options for isotrop isotropic elastoplastic. So we have you know, four different options for the yielding criteria, so we'll just set it to um, von Mises. 
Um, we also have an option for the input type if we want to use strain hardening or not. So we'll just keep it as it is without strain hardening. And then finally, we can define our yield stress. So since it's an A36 deal, we'll keep, keep the yield stress at 36 KSI. Um, also, before you know, running the analysis, one other thing, and I think you know, Ben kind of touched on this too, but we have to define a nonlinear combination. So um, within CIA, we see engineer, we can define low cases, put those low cases into a combination. Um, generally, you know, it's a linear combination, but here we can create a nonlinear combination, and we can actually do that directly from the linear combination, which is um, convenient. So this one includes the um, four different self or four different low cases, so the self weight. We've got an axial load, a shear load, and a moment force at the top of the base of this column here. So this nonlinear combination um, includes all of our cases. And again, I've already run this um, calculation, so for the sake of time, we won't go through that now. Um, so once once the analysis is finished, we can go into the results. And one thing you know that we might want to look at is the stress. So for the for the sake of the example we've got here, I'll first I first just want to look at what the stresses are due to a, a linear analysis, um, as well as I want to see the deformed shape and the stresses that are induced in the model or in the 2D in the 2D elements due to um, if, if if the material were linear. So as you can see, we get stresses up to 116 ksi. You know, not certainly not very realistic for um, an A36 steel. So that just shows the need to do that. We need to do a um, non nonlinear analysis instead of a a linear analysis here. Um, so I can just change, with that I can just change my type of load to the nonlinear combination, this NC1 that we defined earlier. I'm um, still looking at the principal magnitude of stress and select refresh here. And now you can see the maximum stress that we get is 36 KSI, much more realistic. Um, shows that the in the locations where we have kind of this dark red color, that's the location where the steel has yielded. Um, so kind of mainly in the base plate and at the base of the column here. We see we see quite a bit of yielding, and finally, in addition to the stress, we might want to look at um, the principal plastic strain. So we can just change easily here the type of variable to the principal plastic strain, and we can select refresh. And here we can see the amount of strain that is induced in the model. And so I think that just about concludes um, the material plasticity part. So Ben, I'll hand it back over to you. Great, thanks, Garrett. So, um, just a little recap. Um, obviously, we went through some of those uh, different types of analysis, but we wanted to do just a little recap. Obviously, we covered um, some of the information about nonlinear analysis with cables, with soil interaction, uh, the stability analysis, and then material-based plasticity. So, uh, again, just as kind of a recap, you know, I think it's uh, it's it's usable to to talk about you know how these are used on on some different projects, and so. Um, you know, for the advanced analysis with the, with the cables, obviously we see a guide mass like, like the example I showed. Um, we see cable stayed bridge structures. We see fabric structures. Um, you can see the structure on the right actually is the actual SIA model and the real building that was constructed. This was actually done by KPFF um, out of their Portland office. And so this is uh, a really cool structure that's supported by these cables uh, or, or this kind of walkway, this elevated mezzanine area is supported by uh, this, this roof structure um, by cables. And so it's a really interesting project where cables were being used. Um, obviously, we talked about the, uh, the, some of the input data, uh, the ability to do a straight cable or a slack cable. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in that case, the ability to just do an initial force if you want to, initial normal force. Um, and then ultimately the results, you know, what results can you get? Um, obviously, you don't see any bending stiffness in the elements. You get equilibrium of the structure based on that to form shape, especially if you're going to do a slack cable. And then obviously you can use this to comply with all AISC steel code check requirements. And so the steel, the, the cables can be checked for the steel code or, you know, the supporting members uh, which have induced loads in them because of the cables can be checked uh, according to the most recent steel codes. So that's, that's all part of the software. Um, the next type we touched on was this idea of soil interaction. So really using this for mat foundations or, or other foundation considerations, um, really we can do this in a nonlinear or, or linear method. Um, the input data in this case specifically, the most important one is, is this surface support that has some reference to this subgrade modulus, right? That flexible condition, that flexible subgrade spring that you're using to um, do the analysis um, and to you know, figure out what the bearing capacity is. 
Obviously, we didn't talk a lot about the meshing. I had mentioned it briefly, but the finite element mesh is incredibly important in this. Obviously, if you had a finite element mesh that was uh, too coarse, you would get some poor results depending on how you had loads applied and whatnot. We do actually have some automatic mesh refinement tools, um, whether it's local mesh refinement that's done, um, you know, kind of more, more manually, or it's actually automatic mesh refinement that's done based on uh, the loading conditions and the loads applied either are, are possible. And then obviously our results here are verifying bearing pressure um, or verifying those contact stresses, um, whether it's compressive or tensile stress that, that we saw in the model. And then we looked at what Garrett covered. Garrett covered stability, which is a really great module, really useful module for searching for buckling modes that would lead to the collapse in a structure. And really, it's, it, we find it a lot for model validation. People use this Euler buckling theory to understand really how the structure is going to buckle. Really, when you have a, a complex structure or a complex frame that doesn't quite fit into those um, characteristics of the stability um, that's found in AISC, what uh, used to be, I guess, Chapter C, which is now Appendix 7 in the, in the 2010 version of the code, you know, using that criteria doesn't always, you know, work for you. And you saw that in Garrett's example that you really get a failure when, when you truly don't have a failure. It's just because the AISC's provisions don't really specify exactly what's going on. And so in this case, we're doing buckling on whether it's 1D members or 2D members or both together, um, seeing those stability combinations gaining those critical load coefficients, that factor that says it's at this uh, this amount times the load applied that you're going to buckle, and then how the structure is going to buckle, whether it's going to buckle, you know, in this 1D structure, or you can see kind of this, this 2D structure and how that structure is going to buckle with the load applied. And then finally, we spent some time talking about material-based plasticity. And so really this is for a, a kind of a deep dive into an evaluation of ductile, ductile materials and connections. Uh, we saw that with a base plate. Obviously you could use this in a variety of different cases, um, but really people are, we're seeing people use it for steel or for aluminum or for cold form or, or other uh, of those ductile materials. Um, really, like Garrett talked about, we're inputting that material-based uh, behavior, whether it's um, the von Mies or the Mohr Coulomb or there's a few other different types of uh, the Drucker Praga, different types of material-based behaviors that you're going to use. Obviously, you need to specify that yield stress. We still need to do a mesh because we are doing it on 2D elements. And then we're going to go ahead and run our nonlinear combinations. And finally, you know, the outputs being deformations or plastic stress and plastic strain, really uh, as a way to evaluate exactly how the structure is going to uh, react in these nonlinear conditions. So this isn't just a geometric nonlinearity, obviously, but really taking it to the next step and doing material-based uh, nonlinearity and not just allowing the structure to go into these, um, you know, P-delta effects, but taking those P-delta effects, adding on top of them the plasticity and allowing materials uh, to go plastic. And so it's at this time, you know, before we go ahead and open up the, the floor to questions, um, obviously if you want to learn more specifically about the different types of uh, analysis results, um, we can go, you can go to our resource center, which is just resources.cia.net. Obviously there's resources all over that page about various types of analysis. Um, obviously the four we touched on today and then others, dynamics or, or others. Um, if you have questions about other types of analysis, you know, we'd be more than happy to answer them now. A lot of people always ask about a free tryout. You know, what can we do for a tryout? SIA does have a free tryout. Um, it's a full tryout. You can use it. Uh, it's got all the functionality that you that SIA has, so it's not limited in any way. The only limitation is a watermark that's uh, on the um, on the engineering report, so that you don't produce actual work with our tryout. And it's a 30-day tryout, so you can use that for 30 days, evaluate it. Um, you know, you get access to support during that time, and so you can get your questions answered. And so with that being said, um, you know, we'd like to go ahead and open up. Uh, if you have questions, you know, please go ahead and, and, and type those questions into um, that questions window here. And we can go ahead and answer a few different thing, uh, things. One we got a little bit earlier in the presentation I, I'd like to just, uh, um, you know, touch on is someone said, you know, hey, we showed a mat, right? And, and, and but we didn't show kind of how that mat could interact with a superstructure. And so I, I just certainly just did that for simplicity's sake. But in this case, just while we were talking, I went ahead and built just something very small, right? I just built a little, um, you know, a little frame, concrete frame, got rid of the loads that are applied to the structure at those points. But, you know, really, uh, I actually applied a, um, if we go ahead and look at our original load here, I actually applied just a surface load to kind of this panel to distribute to the to the nodes. And so in the, it, this interacts in the same way as, 
as um, you know, what if we applied a, a load to it? Really, it's this mesh, and let's go ahead and turn off these mesh refinements as well, so we can see things a little bit better. You know, it's this mesh, and it, you know, the, the structure, this column here, is connected at this particular internal node within this slab, and it's going to distribute forces based on what's going on in this member. And so, if we look at this member, you know, we can go ahead and see in our results that we've got internal forces. You know, we've got axial force because those are the only forces that we have applied. We've got axial force in this particular column and those axial forces then are applying that contact stress. You know, this is dead and live load now, right? But applying that contact stress at those peak locations for those particular columns. And so we can go ahead and do that, you know, just, you know, they can interact together in, in, in any way they want and it's really just a matter of connecting so there isn't a limitation based on saying hey this is just a slab software this is just a superstructure software you can do all different types um, and, and and kind of do them together in this uh, in this type of in this type of interface and obviously if there are more questions on that we can go ahead and touch on that later I'm more than happy to follow up with you afterwards and and, and touch on that um, we had some other questions about um, about for the soil stuff um, you know, people always ask, you know, when we talk about results, when we get a lot of the peak results, people talk about smoothing of results. And so there's a few different ways to smooth results, really, because you're taking those loads and you're applying them at a singular node. Uh, you know, you really don't have all that load, that point load, going through that singular node. So how do you kind of get the results to be more realistic, if you will? And so in that particular case, you know, we can do a variety of things. Either you could, you know, certainly not use a point load and use maybe a smaller uh, distributed load. Um, we also have, you can also do some mesh refinement there. The other, the kind of the best way we do that is what we call averaging strips. And so we can actually apply what we call an averaging strip to uh, a node or along an edge, and we can use that averaging strip to say, okay, whatever load, whatever results are in this strip area instead of or at that node instead of applying all that 100 kips at that one node I want to average that 100 kips over a 12 by 12 area or 24 by 24 area or, or something else and so in that case we can go ahead and then see a smoothing of results based on those averaging strips and so that does that kind of get gets rid of the, some of those peaks maybe wouldn't require you know uh, would require less shear reinforcement in the slab or something like that because of those peaks um, and so you can get more realistic results based on the fact that your column's actually a 16 by 16 column and you're gonna punch out at this um, you know 45 degree angle throughout the slab um, for foundation design right now we focus on um, mat foundations um, we're actually in development of uh, some other spread uh, some other uh, uh, shallow foundations, mainly pad foundations and wall footings. Um, now you can always just do concrete design, uh, whether you you know made a wall footing or a pad footing. You can always do concrete beam or concrete slab design in SIA. But uh, true foundation modules um, are currently under development and will be out, uh, I think, in uh, our next release. So we had some questions about. Um, for the base plate example, uh, how would you model the interaction with the support of the concrete slab and the steel support versus simple nodal supports at the plate holes? So in that case, again, we could, um, you know, you could model in, if you were just doing that as a base on uh, subsoil, we could do that as subsoil. Um, if it was contacting with, say, concrete, in that case, it might make sense to either model the concrete and then model the subsoil under the concrete, um, or, you know, you could just uh, use a subsoil condition um, a faux subsoil condition, if you will, to uh, model in those springs, you know, to have a spring constant between them. You could also connect them with, um, you know, kind of springs in between the two members um, using rigid links or something like that. So there's a few different ways if you had to, like, connect um, that base plate to, say, a, a concrete, you know, substructure in that particular case. Um, let's see what else we have here. We answered that. So someone asked about um, the other factors, the C1X, Y, the 2X, 2Y, C. How are these calculated? So in that particular case, um, they're not, you know, they would be user input. Um, when you're just looking at contact stresses for the, for the vertical pressure, that C1Z factor is all that matters. Certainly you can get into 
um, looking at those other factors, and they're defined in and how uh, CIA can use them if you want to use them is defined in our in our help sections. Um, then uh, you know you can you can go ahead and and, and include those in, in your analysis because you can look at um, if you want to you can look at the tau stresses and stuff like that rather than the the straight contact stresses. Um, somebody had a question just based on. Uh, based on, you know, kind of interoperability. So uh, they asked about uh, Revit. Obviously, it's a big question that we see all the time. We do, do have Revit interoperability. We have a direct link uh, between C and Revit. So all the 2D members and 1D members that you saw today would all be transferred from Revit or to Revit via that link. Uh, we also have interoperability with SDS2 or with IFC or with just simple DWG, DXF, VRML files. Um, we can export XML to Excel or bring in other Excel files via XML and VBA. So a lot of different ways to, um, you know, leverage external models uh, if you need to. Um, there was a question about uh, modeling passive and active pressures with nonlinear analysis depending on uh, the deflection of a structure. I think that you could probably use some of that nonlinear analysis to approximate, the, approximate those things. Um, you know, but, you know, it's, it, it's really up, it's really up to you in that particular case. Um, you know, we could go ahead and look at some of that stuff. You know, I think we, it probably what makes sense is to look at that, some, some of that stuff in a little bit more, uh, in specific detail to really kind of understand what exactly that, uh, you're using because you could always apply different support conditions different places along the slab, right? Even if you break the slab into, let's say, two or three or ten different 2D elements, if they're connected, they're going to interact kind of as one slab, but they may all have different contact stress supports underneath of them. Um, yeah, someone made a comment about mesh refinement. Yeah, and that's why we talk about the, the uh, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to mesh refine at, at a nodal at a nodal, uh, you know, a place where a node or a load is being added at a node because then you're still going to get peak results at the very small mesh refinements. And that's why we're using, that's why you use averaging strips. So that's the, the reason to use averaging strips is to uh, average those results over, you know, kind of smooth those results over, a, over an area so that you get rid of those peaks then. Um, that's probably the best way to do that. Um, so, uh, Somebody brought up a question about rebar. Um, SIA can do a standard just kind of design of reinforcement, whether it's in 1D members or 2D members. Um, so if it's uh, members based on, uh, you know, you can put in mats or a slab, or excuse me, you could put in, you know, a level of reinforcement at the top or bottom in both directions. You can add uh, additional rebar. You could also, and, and just check it, hey, this is the area of steel I need. This is the, the, the bars I need. Or you could actually add real reinforcement. Um, and so in that way, it would be actually physically uh, either seeing, okay, I need 0.31 square inches per foot in this direction at the bottom or in both directions at the bottom. Then if you wanted to, you could put in fives at 12 and then check to see where you need additional reinforcements. If there's pockets of the model that have uh, higher loads that you would need additional reinforcement, then you could then you could evaluate that because there's an option to check additional reinforcement. So um, C is not going to automatically put real rebar in. Um, but you could put that rebar in yourself if you'd like to. Um, and also, uh, there was another question about Anchorage. C doesn't check the Anchorage, so it's not going to check the development lengths or the, you know, how how far a bar needs to be developed into, um, you know, a, uh, or a hook or something like that. So it's it's not going to check that uh, portion of the design in that kind of detailing way. Um, if you're interested in that, see it, or Nemechek does have a product called AllPlan, um, which uh, does a lot of that stuff, which can, can include a lot of that stuff. And so um, you may be interested in looking at that, that, that AllPlan uh, software. Um, one, of the, one of the other questions, we had a couple questions on precast. Um, so there certainly are some ways to model in precast because you can model in uh, various orthotropic properties in a slab and so that you can create a slab that um, is, you know, has, uh, let's say, a 1D member that's a precast 
uh, plank with a topping slab or something like that and see it can understand that as actual an actual 2d element and with its actual real stiffness properties and so you can you can do that um, you can connect those in, in very you know connect various you know slabs or plates in that way in, in various different ways um, C in the US doesn't do pure pre-stressing right now so you can model and analyze the pre-stressing and the pretension members but you can't do a design of those members quite yet um, and so, uh, but you can analyze that and, and really take a look, uh, a deep dive into the results in that particular case. So uh, there are some options for that. So I think um, that's probably, uh, you know, we've gone through most of the questions here. Obviously, if there are other questions, um, you know, you can, you can go ahead and, and feel free to, you know, to contact either Garrett or myself. Um, you can see both of our, our uh, email addresses there at the bottom, just our first initial and last name at CIASCIA.net. Um, the webinar itself will be posted um, on our YouTube channel and on our website, um, probably, probably on the YouTube channel, probably later today on our website, probably tomorrow. Um, the certificates of, of attendance will go out sometime in the next day or two, but probably by you'll receive them by the end of the week, just by the time we get them through the system and they, everything gets processed. Um, We'll also plan to try to follow up with some people. If you have any questions um, directly, please, by, by all means, email us. But we'll plan to follow up with some people that had, had some questions to see if we can, um, you know, answer more or if there's more, uh, you know, uh, things that people want to talk about. Obviously, again, these were just a few of, of the different types of advanced analysis in SIA Engineer. And so um, if you have any questions on these four types of analysis that we covered or about any of the other types of dynamics or construction staging or direct analysis method or other types of nonlinear or nonlinear springs or friction springs or, you know, tension only members, compression only members, whatever it is, uh, please feel free to ask us or please visit um, our website www.sia.net and you can find some information about that. So with that, um, I thank you for your attendance. I thank you for your participation and um, look forward to our next webinar. Uh, should be sometime uh, next month. We do a webinar every each and every month. And so um, we can, we'll certainly uh, make sure that you uh, get contact with that. But uh, we hope you have a great day and we've been thankful uh, for your participation. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.